Chapter 29 It seemed like a long time before the seagulls were able to pull the peach away from that horrible rainbow cloud, but they managed it at least, and then everybody gathered around the wretched centipede and began arguing about the best way to get the paint off his body. He really did look a sight. He was purple all over, and now that the paint was beginning to dry and harden, he was forced to sit very stiff and upright, as though he were encased in cement. And all 42 of his legs were sticking out straight in front of him like rods. I can just picture this, you guys. He tried to say something, but his lips wouldn't move. All he could do now was to make gurgling noises in his throat. The old green grasshopper reached out and touched him carefully on the stomach. But how could it possibly have dried so quickly? He asked. Well, it's rainbow paint, James answered. Rainbow paint dries very quick and very hard. Oh, I detest paint, Miss Spider announced. It frightens me. It reminds me of Aunt Spiker. Well, the late Aunt Spiker. I mean, because the last time she painted her kitchen ceiling, my poor darling grandmother stepped into it by mistake when it was still wet, and there she stuck. And all through the night, we could hear her calling to us, saying, Help, help, help. And it was heartbreaking to listen to. But what could we do? Not a thing until the next day when the paint had dried. And then, of course, we all rushed over to her and calmed her down and gave her some boo, some food. Believe it or not, she lived for six months like that, upside down on the ceiling, with her legs stuck permanently in the paint. She really did. We fed her every day. We brought her fresh flies straight from the web. But then on the 26th of April last Aunt Sponge, the late Aunt Sponge, I mean, happened to glance up at the ceiling, and she spotted her. A spider, she cried. A disgusting spider. Quick, fetch me the mop with the long handle. And then, it was so awful, I can't bear to think of it. Miss Spider wiped away a tear and looked sadly at the centipede. You poor thing, she murmured. I do feel sorry for you. It'll never come off, the earthworm said brightly. Our centipede will never move again. He will turn into a statue, and we shall be able to put him in the middle of the lawn with a bird bath on the top of his head. We could try peeling him like a banana, the old green grasshopper suggested, or rubbing him with sandpaper, the ladybug said. Now, if he stuck out his tongue, the earthworm said, smiling a little for perhaps the first time in his life, if he stuck it out real far, then we could all catch hold of it and start pulling. And if we pulled hard enough, we could turn him inside out and he would have a new skin. There was a pause while the others considered this interesting proposal. I think... James said slowly, I think that the best thing to do, and then he stopped. What was that? He asked quite quickly. I heard a voice. I heard someone shouting. Who is it, you guys? Chapter 30. They all raised their heads, listening. Shh, there it is again. But the voice was too far away for them to hear what it was saying. It's a cloud man. I just know it's a cloud man. They're after us again. Well, it came from above. The earthworm said. Automatically, everybody looked up and everybody except the centipede who couldn't move. Ouch, they said. Help, mercy, we're going to catch it this time. For what they saw now saw swirling and twisting directly over their heads was an immense black cloud. A terrible, listen to these kind of synonyms, you guys, dangerous, thundery looking thing that began to rumble and roar even as they were staring at it. And then from high up on the top of the cloud, the faraway voice, hey, what would be an antonym for far away? Came down to them once again, this time very loud and clear. On with the faucets, it shouted. On with the faucets, on with the faucets. Three seconds later, the hole underneath of the cloud seemed to split and burst open like a paper bag. And then out came the water. They saw it coming. It was quite easy to see because it wasn't just raindrops. It wasn't raindrops at all. It was a great solid mass of water that might have been a lake or a whole ocean dropping out of the sky on top of them. And down it came, down and down and down, crashing first into the seagulls and then onto the peach itself, while the poor travelers shrieked with fear and groped around frantically for something to catch hold of, the peach stem, the silk strings, anything they could find. And all the time, the water came pouring and roaring down upon them, bouncing and smashing and sloshing and slashing and swashing and swirling and surging and whirling and gurgling and gushing and rushing and rushing. And it was like being pinned down underneath the biggest waterfall in the world and not being able to get out. They couldn't speak. They couldn't see. They couldn't breathe. 
and James Henry Trotter, holding on madly to one of the silk strings above the peach stem, told himself that this must surely be the end of everything at last. But then, just as suddenly as it had started, the deluge stopped. They were out of it, and it was all over. The wonderful seagulls had flown right through it and come out safely on the other side. Once again, the giant peach was sailing peacefully through the mysterious moonlit sky. I'm drowned, gasped the old green grasshopper spinning out water by the pint. It's gone right through my skin, the earthworm groaned. I always thought my skin was waterproof, but it isn't, and now I'm full of rain. <laughs> look at me, look at me, shouted the centipede excitedly. It washed me clean, the paint's all gone, I can move again. <sighs> That's the worst news I've had in a long time, the earthworm said. The centipede was dancing around on the deck, turning somersaults in the air and singing at the top of his voice, Oh, hooray for the storm and the rain. I can move. I don't feel any pain. And now I'm a pest. I'm the biggest and best, the most marvelous pest once again. Oh, do be quiet, the old green grasshopper said. Look at me, cried the centipede. Look at me. I'm freed. I'm freed. Not a scratch, nor a bruise, nor a bleed. To his grave, this fine gent they all thought they had sent, and I'm very near went. Oh, I very near went, but they sent quite the wrong centipede. Chapter 31. How fast are we going all of a sudden? The ladybug said. I wonder why. Well, I don't think the seagulls like this place any better than we do, James answered. I imagine they want to get out of it as soon as they can. They got a bad fright in the storm we've just been through. Faster and faster flew the seagulls, skimming across the sky at a tremendous pace. With the peach trailing out behind them, cloud after cloud went by on either side, all of them ghostly white in the moonlight, moonlight and several more times during the night, the travelers caught glimpses of cloudmen moving around on the tops of those clouds, working their sinister magic upon the world below. Once, they passed a snow machine in operation, with the cloud men turning the handle and a blizzard of snowflakes blowing out of the great funnel above. They saw the huge drums that were used for making thunder, and the cloud men beating them furiously with long hammers. Okay, I love the visual this gives me, you guys. Next time, next time it snows or thunders, I'm going to envision these cloud men. <laughs> They saw the great, the frost factories and the wind producers and the places where cyclones and tornadoes were manufactured and sent spinning down toward the earth. And once, deep in a hollow of a large billowy cloud, they spotted something that only, um, that could only have been a cloud men city. There were caves everywhere running into the cloud and at the entrances of the caves, the, cl the caves, the cloud men's wives were crouching over little stoves with frying pans in their hands frying snowballs for their husband's suppers. <laughs> and hundreds of cloud men's children were frisking about all over the place and shrieking with laughter and sliding down the billows of the cloud on toboggans. An hour later, just before the dawn, the travelers heard a soft whooshing noise above their heads, and they glanced up and saw an immense gray bat-like creature swooping down toward them out of the dark. It circled around and around the peach, flapping its great wings slowly in the moonlight and staring at the travelers. Then it uttered a series of long, deep, melancholy cries and flew off again into the night. Oh, I do wish the morning would come, Miss Spider said, shivering all over. It won't be long now, James answered. Look, it's getting lighter over there already. They all sat in silence watching the sun as it came up, slowly over the rim of the horizon for a new day. Chapter 32 and when the full daylight came at last, they all got to their feet and stretched their poor cramped bodies. And then the centipede, who always seemed to see things first, shouted, Look, there's land below. He's right, they cried, running to the edge of the peach and peering over. Hooray, hooray! It looks like streets and houses, but how enormous it all is. A vast city glistening in the early morning sunshine lay spread out 3,000 feet below them. At that height, the cars were like little beetles crawling along the street. And people were walking on the pavements looking no larger than tiny grains of soot. But what tremendous tall buildings, exclaimed the ladybug. Ooh, where are they at? I've never seen anything like them before in England. Which town do you think it is? Well, this couldn't possibly be England, said the old green grasshopper. Then where is it? asked Miss Spider. You know what those buildings are? shouted James, jumping up and down with excitement. Those are the skyscrapers. So this must be America, 
And that, my friends, means that we have crossed the Atlantic Ocean overnight. <gasps> you don't mean it, they cried. It's not possible. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. Oh, I've only dreamed of going to America, cried the centipede. I had a friend once there who... Be quiet, said the earthworm. Who cares about your friend? The thing we've got to think about now is how on earth are we going to get down to earth? Well, ask James, said the ladybug. I don't think that should be so very difficult, James told them. All we'll have to do is to cut a loose a few seagulls, not too many, mind you, but just enough so that the others can't quite keep us up in the air. Then down we shall go slowly and gently until we reach the ground. Centipede will bite through the strings for us one at a time. Okay, how is this going to turn out, do you think? Hmm.